Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the Saturday talk, the second Saturday talk for the month of June. And uh, today we have with us Dr. Solit Senanayaka. Uh, he's a consultant cardiologist and a lecturer in the Department of Pharmacology at Faculty of Medicine, University of Sri Jai Bharatanapura. And uh, he is trained in cardiology at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital in London. And uh, he is today to, here to uh, give us an update or, on hyperlipidemia with a very interesting title called Is My Cholesterol Level Right? And uh, on a slightly non-academic aspect, he is a talented guitarist and a vocalist. And uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, that should be also uh, in the league of preventing heart diseases in Sri Lanka. So over to you, Dr. Solit. Uh, would you care to um, share your screen and your PowerPoint presentation, please? Yeah, thank you, Nilanka. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me. Nilanka, can you hear me properly? Yes, I can hear you. Maybe if you can speak a little bit louder. Yeah. I'm, I think it's yeah, something so to do with my... Just, uh, yeah. Let me just share the screen for all of you to see. So basically, uh, yeah, one second. All right, Skin, just bear with me for a second. So, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak at the Saturday Forum. Uh, I'll try to make it as uh, comprehensive and interesting as possible. So it is a topic that uh, most of us or the general population is basically very interested about. And uh, it's something that most of the physicians, not only cardiologists and even the general practitioners basically manage. So it is a topic that most of you should be probably be familiar with. So why are we worried or this interested about uh, managing hyperlipidemia? So basically, why we worry? If you all know, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is still the number one killer globally. And even in Sri Lanka, the numbers are same. So proven effect of high cholesterol in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, basically uh, we all, it's proven that high cholesterol basically plays a big role in the development of cardiovascular disease. It could be a could, could be coronary artery disease, it could be peripheral vascular disease, it could even be cerebral vascular disease where you might end up with a stroke. So the primary goal is to reduce cardiovascular disease and death. So the whole idea of treating high lipids or cholesterol is basically to prevent any cardiovascular event or ultimately prevent somebody dying. So before we go on to the treatment aspects, we'll just quickly go through what actually happens in a blood vessel or what happens to or how our body basically builds up cholesterol. So most of the dietary cholesterol that we take in is, which is one of the main sources of cholesterol comes. So if you take, uh, if we take in a meal, uh, what happens is the cholesterol is basically absorbed as chylomicrons. That is a basically a large particle, which basically gets absorbed and transported into the liver. So in the liver, what happens is from this uh, particles, they are transformed into slightly smaller particles called VLDL. So the triglyceride, 
The chylomicrons are basically rich in triglycerides. And then the VLDL and the IDL particles, they are also richer in triglycerides, but they do contain uh, a certain degree of uh, cholesterol as well, LDL. So basically, the VLDL is converted to IDL and then eventually forms LDL. This particle is the one which is basically rich in cholesterol. So uh, these LDL uh, cholesterol particles are basically taken up either by the liver or transported into tissues where they are basically deposited. So that is the one basically gives us all the headache. And of course, there are HDL particles, which is another form of uh, 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 lipoproteins, which basically transports the cholesterol back into the liver. So we take it as the good cholesterol. So the basically the 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 the, the commonest sources of cholesterol in our body is basically by ingestion of food or our diet, then we have amount of fat stored in our body which can be utilized and the other major organ which basically produces cholesterol would be the liver. So as I said, the different lipoproteins have different sizes. It is important in the pathogenesis. So just to give you an idea, chylomicrons are the bigger ones. And then as we go down, the size of the lipoprotein particles reduce. And the smallest one would be the HDL. And uh, the LDL particles would be around 80 to 25 uh, nanometers. So the types of lipoproteins in our circulation, as we discussed earlier, plasma lipoproteins are basically, there is chylomicrons. Then the atherogenic non-HDL cholesterol, which basically gives us all the problems. Out of that, the VLDL, IDL, both have more triglycerides. And the LDLC particle basically is divided into LDL and lipoprotein little a. So there are two particles which basically carry uh, the LDL cholesterol. And you have the uh, LDL, HDL, uh, which contains APOA1. So the, the, the interesting part is all of these, VLDL, IDL, LDL, all of them carry this lipoprotein uh, APO100. So this is the, the lipoprotein basically is involved in the process of uh, atherogenesis. So just to basically uh, give you an idea of the, the particle size, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as the particle size gets bigger, uh, the, the, the triglyceride, amount of triglyceride in the particles are more. So this, the size of these particles directly relate to the pathogenesis because what happens is uh, as we grow older and with some form of uh, endothelial damage or inflammation, there is gaps between the endothelial uh, in the endothelium. So what happens is that some of the particles can basically uh, get into the intima and basically can be taken up by the macrophage and then they become foam cells and they turn into this lipid core. So this is basically the, the pathogenesis of uh, a cholesterol plaque. So why the size is important is uh, normally if a particle is less than 70 nanometers, then the particles get, can get into the intima through the, the epithelium. So 
the, the bigger particles like the chylomicrons won't be able to basically get into the intima. The very small particles like HDL will get into the intima, but they can even get into the media and then get out sometimes because the particles are very small. But particles which are, which are basically uh, in the size of 18 to 25, which is basically the size of LDL, will probably remain in the intima and basically contribute to the formation of this lipid core. So eventually, they will end up with something like this uh, as time goes on. So this is the one that basically produces symptoms or uh, leads to uh, a cardiovascular event. As I said, as time goes on, the, the lipid core can become unstable and then due to different kinds of stresses, can basically damage the epithelium and then form a clot, which basically leads to a, either a, a heart attack or myocardial infarction or even a stroke. So uh, when we do angiogram, this is what we normally see uh, in the angiogram, a narrowing. And sometimes if there's a clot, a complete block in the vessels. So the goal is to basically prevent things like this from happening. So how do we calculate your LDL? So uh, in our clinical practice, a lot of people come and say, uh, doctor, my cholesterol level is high. So people normally tend to take the total cholesterol as their marker of high cholesterol. So basically uh, that is something which is because of the unawareness of what L the 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 whole, uh, to how the total cholesterol is basically formed. So they basically, in, the, in layman's term, basically take uh, the total cholesterol as their target or, 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 or the marker that they are basically worried about. So normally what we calculate is the LDLC, uh, which includes LDL plus uh, lipoprotein little a. Uh, there are new assays which basically can uh, differentiate uh, or segment uh, some of the uh, some of these uh, uh, segments, but normally what how they how they calculate is you uh, reduce the total color, the HDL and uh, uh, triglycerides divided by five. Uh, that is what we are basically familiar with uh, from the total cholesterol. So. Uh, the problem is there are some pitfalls in this calculation because if your triglycerides are very high, so if it's more than 400, the formula can't be used. Uh, and then you should basically consider non-fasting samples and uh, take uh, maybe do uh, laboratory assays, which can be done in the newer labs. And a lot of people talk about whether we should do fasting or non-fasting. So traditionally, when we were students, we normally used to take fasting uh, lipid profiles. But what they now uh, say is uh, the recent studies basically comparing the fasting and non-fasting, uh, the, the differences seems to be very small. So uh, if you... Uh, what basically affects the non-fasting would be your chylomicrons. So it affects the triglycerides. So roughly, no, if you take your LDL level, your non-fasting LDL level should be about 25 milligrams per deciliter more. So if it's your LDL is 75, your non-fasting would be roughly around 100. So... Uh, unless you have very high triglycerides when you, where you can't interpret your, your uh, cholesterol levels, you can even go for non-fasting uh, assays. So this is something we try to now completely uh, disregard because most of the labs will give you uh, a range, but uh, and 
you get false reassurance. Uh, a lot of people do get, even the doctors sometimes will falsely reassure some of your patients uh, if the patients are within any of these ranges. So uh, the, the trends of treatment have basically changed. So what we want to discuss or give you an insight about is this uh, change in the trends or how we basically plan out or decide whether somebody needs to be treated. So the key concepts would be do not follow or treat patients according to the ranges. So most of the labs will issue you uh, their normal ranges and it varies according to lab. So sometimes you can get confused. One lab will give you a certain reference range. Another one will give you another reference range. Then you're basically sometimes confused whether uh, the, whether the patient's level is within the normal range. What you need to know is, so this discussion is about preventing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So the primary goal would be that you treat and you try to prevent somebody getting a heart attack. So your primary target would be the LDL cholesterol. So that is the major risk factor for atherogenesis. VLDL and IDL, yes, they do carry triglycerides, uh, but they, like I said, have the same ApoB100. So sometimes they can lead to residual disease. That's why even if your triglycerides are high, we treat your LDL. With that, your triglycerides would also come down. And if you still have residual disease, we will think of treating your triglycerides. And do not worry about your total cholesterol or your HDL. So HDL, yes, it is a good marker in studies. It has shown that it has a positive correlation with good effects on the cardiovascular system, but uh, there have been uh, medication or treatments that have been developed to see whether a rise in the HDL would uh, uh, prevent a cardiovascular event, but so far up to now, none of the trials have shown that increasing your HDL itself will bring you additional protection. So, but it is a good marker of your cardiovascular risk. So, this is something that you probably need to uh, be aware of. So, we normally follow European guidelines more than the American because our system is, or our system basically follows uh, a bit of the, the, the European system. So it is not the ranges we now think of the target values according to your level of risk. So for people who have never had any cardiovascular event, you have different risk scores. So you need to if you get a patient or a family member or somebody that you think needs to be treated, you find a high cholesterol level or a, a abnormal uh, lipid report, and then you have you have to make the decision, okay, I'm, whether I'm going to treat this patient or not. So somebody who's not had an event. So in that case, you can use some of these risk scores to decide whether you're going to treat this patient. So uh, as your level of risk increases, the targets basically become lower and lower. So for the general population with no, let's say a young person with no risk factors, where you're, so there are several scores systems that scoring systems that we use to calculate the 10 year cardiovascular risk. So this score is one of the, the, the scoring systems that we use. It, it is basically validated for the Euro, the European population. And they basically, I, I'll talk to you about that uh, as we go on. So what you need to know is your targets. So ideally, if you know these four targets, then you can basically work out your plan of management. So if somebody is at a lower risk, that is, you don't have risk factors, your target 
LDL target should be ideally below 160. For somebody who has moderate risk, so let's say somebody who has diabetes who, uh, below 50 years with another risk factor, young patients, your target should be maybe 100. And if you have a, what do you call, uh, a high risk, so there are criteria to basically say whether the patient is high risk. Those patients or patients with very high risk, eventually your target should be less than 70 and 55. So if you ever had a heart attack or any stroke or any form of uh, cardiovascular event, or even if, let's say you get screened by doing a angiogram or a CT coronary angiogram and you find uh, blocks of more than let's say 50% uh, in two vessels, then you eventually become very high risk. Then your target should be 55. It doesn't matter whether you can achieve that target by jumping up and down. You don't have to actually uh, always take medication, but your target should be 55. How you achieve it is either by lifestyle or by medication, whatever it is, that is your target. So to prevent another episode, what is this very high group? So if you have two events within two years, let's say somebody had a TIA or stroke last year and they come up, come with another heart attack this year. So they, they fall on to very high risk. In that those kind of patients, your target should be less than 40. And we'll talk about that as well, the, some of the myths about reducing cholesterol to lower levels. So who do we treat? Like I said, the risk assessment is very important when you decide on treating your patients. If you are at a very high risk or high risk, so very high risk is, like I said, establish cardiovascular disease. So that's either somebody who's had an event or who gets screened and then they 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 are fine like you find that they have uh, narrowings if you have diabetes with target organ damage or three established risk factors if you are type on 20 years you eventually ultimately fall onto the category of very high risk ckd below egfr below 30 is again, very high risk. And calculated risk of more than 10 or a family history of uh, heart disease with one or more risk factors. So then your target should be 55. So you don't wait to initiate treatment. So all of these patients should be on, uh, although I said uh, you can even try jumping up and down, these patients should uh, invariably be on statin. So, that is because statins have proven to basically reduce uh, uh, cardiovascular mortality. So high risk patients would be patients with high blood pressure, family history without other risk factors, moderate CKD, diabetes more than 10 years. And this is important. At some, even at some point, if your total cholesterol had been more than 310 or LDL cholesterol more than 190. So this is the range that we basically screen somebody for familiar for a familial component if you have a cholesterol level to about this level then you have to think whether this patient has any possibility of a genetic component or a monogenic not polygenic so uh, we'll come to that or a risk of between 5 to 10. so these are the european uh, risk scores for high risk and low risk. So, uh, according to the geographic areas, they are basically divided uh, the European population into high risk and low risk. So, the the factors we consider would be whether the we consider the, the gender, the age, blood pressure, the cholesterol levels. So, according to that, you can basically categorize these patients into your charts and basically calculate their 10-year risk score. So the, the, the ESC guidelines basically give these scores and they use this score system. That is what they use in Europe. Apart from this, we can use the WHO system 
in our country. That is something I think people use commonly. I use something called QRISC3 score, which is basically uh, there is an app where you can use. The good thing about that is that it has a South Asian component because uh, South Asians are taken into a, a, a higher risk category. So that is something I use because I used to work in a center uh, which speciali specialized in advanced lipid management. So we use that risk score. So it, it has an app as well. So you can basically use it. So this is the score system. 10-year cumulative risk of a first uh, atherosclerotic cardiac event. So very, so these are the target uh, uh, or the targets or the goals that you have to basically achieve. So when you calculate your risk score, if it falls under any of, it will fall under I, any one of these. So then you decide whether you're going to treat them or not, depending on your risk score. So apart things that do not come into this uh, risk scores, but does basically modify or as a positive or a negative impact on further cardiovascular events. So things like social deprivation, obesity, physical inactivity, uh, psychosocial stress, uh, family history of premature coronary artery disease, immune mediated diseases, so all of these obstructive sleep apnea, these can all basically contribute to uh, increasing the risks, but which are not basically uh, considered in the risk scores. So treatment options, remember your core would be basically lifestyle modification. So, at any stage, uh, lifestyle modification is basically applicable. You need to uh, think of lifestyle modification, even if you're at low risk, or even if you're at very high risk, your lifestyle modifications come under your co-management. And your when you talk about the medication, statins, invariably is your number one go-to medication unless there is a specific contraindication. Because time and it's a medication that is basically being tested time and time again with good safety profile and uh, positive effects on cardiovascular mortality outcome. So with statins, even with uh, the, the highest tolerable dose, if you can't achieve your ta LDL targets, then you think of adding other medication, which will basically bring down your cholesterol levels, LDL levels. So the ones which, have, which we practically and commonly use the, would be drugs like acetamide. Then you have this set of injectables, which is called the PCSK9 inhibitors. They are basically given as injectable medication, you can give it either uh, two weekly or four weekly or six weekly. And there is a newer drug called Inclisera, which is again, an, uh, uh, which falls on, uh, under the uh, subcategory of PCSK9, uh, which is given six monthly. So the, the time duration is long. And all of these have shown that it basically, most of the trials have shown that uh, they bring down LDL cholesterol uh, significantly. Uh, I will touch on this medication called bempidoic acid, which is coming up. So for a country like us, where we can't basically afford PCSK9 inhibitors, bempidoic acid might uh, become an alternative in the future. And apart from this, there are a set of patients where none of these work, who will need uh, uh, lipophoresis. So in my center where I work, we had a program where some of the patients who've had multiple cardiovascular events uh, undergoing regular uh, apheresis, which actually works. So 
as I said, lifestyle modifications is it's a it's a core part of your uh, treatment strategy. Uh, I mean, uh, if you go through any of uh, the the preventative, uh, not only for cardiovascular medicine, a uh, lot of people will talk about or people who are interested about healthy living will talk about this. So I'm not going to go into detail because it is something that we talk in, but I don't think that people pay enough attention, but I think the younger generation is a bit more aware of what they eat, uh, how, how they work out and about uh, uh, maintaining good physical health. So, Intensity of lipid lowering treatment. We talk about uh, the percentage reduction. So uh, we talk about this: the the two high risk groups. They they are pay the. It's a population where we basically start on high intensity statin. So what is the meaning of high intensity statin? So high intensity statin is that when you give uh, a dose. So, for example, if you take atorvastatin, it's 40 to 80. If you take rosuvastatin, it's 20 to 40. So, that is high intensity. So, that's a higher dose. The problem is sometimes the Asian population might not basically tolerate uh, the high intensity statins uh, because of uh, side effects. But the whole idea is when you give a high intensity statin, your LDL level should come down by 50%. So let's say if your baseline LDL is 200, by giving a high intensity statin, it has to come down to 100. So sometimes that might not be enough to achieve your target uh, LDL goal. So if you have, if you're a high risk person and your LDL target is 200, just by giving a high intensity statin, you might not achieve the target of 70. That's why sometimes you have to add a second medication, let's say, especially after you get, so people who have worked in medical wards or cardio, cardio units would know uh, most of the time, if a patient comes with a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, you treat them, you start them on high intensity statins. Then after about six to uh, eight weeks, you uh, get them back, see whether you have achieved uh, your target. So in that case, if your starting target uh, LDL level was 200, you will never be able to get it down to 70 just by uh, giving high intensity statin alone. So that's why you might need to add a second medication like acetamide, which is quite safe and most patients do tolerate them quite well. So whatever your target goal is, you need to know how you're going to manipulate your medication to achieve your target. So that is your goal as a treating physician. So if you give, like I said, the PCSK9 inhibitors, they achieve a, a bigger reduction in LDL cholesterol. So it reduces up to about 60%. So imagine if you combine PCSK9 with high intensity plus acetamide, it is about 85% reduction from your baseline. So that's why actually some people, patients do need PCSK9 inhibitors. Unfortunately, because of the cost, we don't have, I think in the private sector, some of uh, the cardiologists do use it in special cases where they really need to bring down the cholesterol level to uh, target levels. Uh, so the whole idea of uh, LDL reduction or the percentages uh, is uh, understanding the combinations of the medication and their percentage reductions. So something all of you know, uh, which has been taught during your uh, medical school times. So HEMG, OA reductase inhibitors, commonly known as statins, so they basically, uh, they are competitive inhibitors of uh, HMG-CoA reductase. So it is the rate limiting enzyme. Uh, 
uh, in the mevalonate pathway for converting FGMG CoA to mevalonate, which is a precursor of cholesterol. So by inhibiting this rate limiting step, basically we try to reduce the number of uh, cholesterol particles, thereby increasing the LDL receptors in the uh, the hepatocyte. So it will be increasing the LDL receptors will basically extract more LDL and again uh, indirectly will reduce cholesterol. So this is uh, data from uh, some of the, the, the commonly known statins, rosuvastatin and atuvastatin. Both basically there are many statins uh, dating back to 90s and all of them basically show most of them have shown that they reduce all cause death, stroke, myocardial infarction, and uh, any coronary revascularization. So basically, it's a time tested drug uh, with a good safety profile, I would say. So the problems that we do encounter, the commonest would be myalgia. Uh, some people do, uh, that's about maybe one in 10 would. Uh, experience myopathy and statin-induced muscle symptoms. And it can affect the liver uh, in very few cases and rarely can cause serious hepatotoxicity. There is a debate about new uh, onset diabetes in a very small uh, number of patients. So the problem here is when you, when you practically treat patients, you normally do tell the patients regarding uh, symptoms. Most of us do that. You talk about muscle symptoms and all that. What happens is the moment you get a neck pain or a pain somewhere, they basically attribute it to your statins and they basically stop it. So that is a problem. Sometimes you do encounter that uh, they, uh, they basically think of uh, or attribute all your symptoms to uh, this statin induced uh, side effects, so which is not the case. Like what is happening now that uh, if, when you in your clinical practice, if you meet uh, your patients, most of them will attribute most of your symptoms to uh, the COVID vaccination. So it is something like that. So acetamide and add-on therapy, which we did discuss, it uh, basically uh, acts on the NPC1 L1 protein, which is a transporter located in the brush border uh, in the in the intestines. So basically, uh, it inhibits the absorption of cholesterol, thereby decreasing the delivery of cholesterol to the liver and uh, reducing the hepatic uh, LDL stores. So that will upregulate your LDL receptors and basically uh, uh, reduce uh, cholesterol. So it doesn't. Like I said, it doesn't basically, uh, acetamide uh, will basically have about a 15% reduction. So it doesn't, it, it is only used as add-on therapy. It is not used as for, uh, so don't start patients on acetamide unless if the patient is really intolerant to statins. So normally the dose is 10 milligrams. The common side effects would be related to GI disturbances, but most of the time uh, they they recover within a couple of weeks. So it is a transient uh, phenomenon in most of the cases, and most of the patients do tolerate well. And the side effect profile is uh, less, so it's it's a quite safe medication. Like I said, PCSK9 inhibitors. Most of the trials have shown marked reduction in LDLC. And with that, a uh, uh, relative reduction in uh, most of the cardiovascular events. So if you have the option of using PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, I have used it uh, uh, when I was training and I have a positive uh, 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 attitude towards this medication because the safety profile is also not too bad and uh, the, the results are quite... Uh, Remarkable. I want to talk a little bit about bempidoic acid, which is a newer drug, which is basically FDA approved, but not 
registered in Sri Lanka. So it's basically, it acts or inhibits a higher level, uh, a, a step in the, the, the HMG CoA reductase pathway. So uh, thereby basically reducing LDL. So the dose is 180 milligrams. Uh, the side effects are hyperuricemia. Uh, you don't use it in patients with gout and anemia. Uh, so it's a medication which is under uh, uh, some of the trials. So they, there was a trial which came out, which was called CLEAR study, which was done in patients who couldn't basically tolerate statins due to different reasons. And they basically started these patients on bempidoic acid and uh, they observe for any cardiovascular mortality benefit. And uh, surprisingly, they showed reduction in myocardial infarctions, coronary vascularization. So this might be a drug which might come up uh, in the future as uh, even into the guidelines. So uh, something to look forward to. We do use it in uh, United Kingdom. So people who can't tolerate statins, but who need uh, uh, a cardiovascular mortality benefit. Familial hypercholesteremia, like I said, uh, it's a genetic disease caused by mutation. So it's a, it's not polygenic, it's monogenic. So a mutation in one of the genes, basically leading to high levels of lipoprotein. Uh, cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. I'm not going to do go into details about the mechanism, but uh, what you normally find in clinical practice is people with very high levels of uh, LDL cholesterol. So they might have tendon xanthomas or, uh, uh, or even uh, uh, different uh, uh, subcutaneous deposits. So the, the homozygous once basically manifest, manifest in early childhood. So that's why, why I wanted to highlight this is, uh, so when do we suspect this patient? So if you, in your clinical practice, come across somebody who has very high cholesterol levels, that is if your total cholesterol is more than 290 and LDL of more than 190. So that is one. Everybody who has high cholesterol like that won't have familial. So most of them would have polygenic. So it's either diet, uh, 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 maybe some of the genes uh, uh, contributing, but not, But in this kind of patients, just go through the history and see whether there is any family member who has a, a, a cardiovascular event uh, below the age of 60 or a second degree relative below the age of 50. So that is very important, asking for a family history regarding your uh, any cardiovascular events. If you find that, so if you have a high level and uh, a positive family history, then they're probably uh, categorized under possible. But if you want to be exactly sure you need to do, you have to either find uh, Santomas, uh, in the first degree relatives or yourself or you have to check for the, the uh, LDL receptor mutation. So that is very, uh, we do it in other countries, but in Sri Lanka, we don't have the facilities. It's very expensive. So what you can do is basically, I at least suspect these patients might be having a familial component. And the, so this is the Simon group criteria, which we use, but there's another criteria called Dutch lipid clinic uh, network criteria, which you can use, but it's a bit more complex. So either way, uh, have an idea of about uh, uh, the possibility of a familial component. So that so if the patients have confirmed familial hypercholesteremia, they fall under high risk, and your ta LDL targets should change. These are the ones who develop uh, cardiovascular events prematurely. And the other thing is, you can screen your the, those children or their children at an early stage. And then you can start treatment. And they need to be followed up very closely. 
and you need to do timely interventions like do CT angiograms and things like that. And you basically should refer these patients to a specialized care. So a couple of case histories. This is a 52-year-old businessman, type 2 diabetes for 12 years, on treatment for hypertension, presented with chest pain, and found to have anterior STEMI or myocardial heart attack. Thrombolysis done and discharged on optimum medical treatment, including atrocytin 40. So after six weeks, this is this patient's uh, lipid profile. People who think they are happy about this, so we don't know the, the starting cholesterol level, but when you look at this, people can be think that, okay, this looks quite satisfactory. Your total cholesterol is 135. A lot of the, 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 the general population would be very happy because this is basically below the range and your LDL is like a half. HDL is not too bad. Triglycerides are also within the normal range. Anybody who wants to comment on this would appreciate if somebody wants would like to basically give their thoughts so this becomes more interactive. Do you think that uh, we have achieved the target? So in this case, as we discussed, if you have a, if you develop a coronary event, basically, you fall into very high risk. So your LDL target should be less than 55. So in these patients, we might think, okay, we have done well, but we have basically not achieved the LDL target. So the options are, if you're on 40, you can basically go up to 80. But the problem is your side effects, probably your side effect profile might become more than uh, the, the benefit. So they might not tolerate and eventually stop the medication. So what you could do is maybe add estimate uh, to this patient and then basically repeat uh, after a few weeks to see whether you have achieved the target. So remember, and, and another important point is, let's say you come with a heart attack and within the first 24 hours, you do a lipid profile and your LDL is 90. Then your target should not be 55. It should be 50% reduction from your uh, baseline. So from 90, it should be 45, not 55. The, 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 the target is uh, a 50% reduction in your baseline LDL level. So in that kind of patient, your target should be actually uh, 45. Second case, a 58-year-old female receptionist, family history of ischemic heart disease, uh, consumes alcohol, smokes occasionally, BMI of 33, blood pressure is on the high side, uh, impaired fasting. So this kind of patient, basically, your total cholesterol is 178, uh, LDL is 98, again, not too bad, HDL is 32, your triglycerides are slightly high, uh, which is the case in most of these Asians uh, who have metabolic syndrome. So I'll go to the, uh, probably tell you the thought process. Again, you have to basically calculate their risk. So somebody who, who's had a family history of ischemic heart disease and risk factors, patient, uh, even with family history of uh, with family history, without other major risk factors, fall into high risk. So then your, again, your LDL target should be uh, 70. Inv invariably, when you treat these patients with uh, a statin, your triglycerides will come down. Uh, and even after that, if your triglycerides are more than 150, only you think of basically treating your hypertriglyceridemia. You don't basically uh, treat it as the first line. So what is good or bad about us, the, the Asian population? 
we are a bit funny because our ldl levels are not as high as the the europeans but we do have low hdls we have elevated non hdl our apo b particles are elevated elevated lipoprotein a elevated levels of uh, small ldl so somebody who has a ldl cholesterol of 3 could have uh, a very high number the asians have very high number of apoB particles so the the particle sizes are small uh uh but uh, what the 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 they are dense so you have more particles uh which give a ldl cholesterol of 3 so uh, elevated Uh, apoB particles and LPA both will basically contribute to uh, a high coronary risk. So that's why invariably the Asian population is at a higher risk of developing uh, coronary artery disease. So our our targets, the Indian guidelines say, uh, give a even a lower target because uh, we have to basically we don't have Sri Lankan data to say uh, what our targets are. So we might need to basically come up with. Uh, our own uh, uh, levels in the future so common myths people think that too much or uh, the lower the cholesterol level is also not that great because people think it can lead to stroke risk increase the risk of cancer dementia and but none of the trials have shown that uh, uh, any of this is true so reducing your number of Uh, the LDL to a lower level basically uh, is not that harmful. So you don't have a evidence to say the lower level. Uh, if you reduce it to to uh, to a lower level, that it will have adverse effects. So that is that should not be a, a, a limiting factor to basically treat your patients uh, and try to prevent them from getting uh, a, a, a coronary event in the future. So there is basically a gap between what we know and what we basically sometimes in practice uh, in the clinical setting. So in real world, we see a gap between the evidence and that what we actually practice, because there are patient-related factors, physician-related factors, and common myths basically limit. So the patient-related factors could be things like. Uh, the side effects or even the slightest side effects or or overthinking about side effects basically reducing them from taking uh, their medication and them not knowing their targets and their the level of risk and also uh, the the compliance so people what happens is they will take medication when their levels come down to the the ranges that people think are normal then they will basically stop it physician factors again what happens is you when you don't know your targets you basically will treat the patients uh, we, everybody will know how to treat with a statin so that's that's something uh, it's not a rocket science so people will treat you or, or treat your patients and then uh, the follow up will not happen properly and most of these common myths also limit uh, the treatment or or achieving your targets so what you basically need to know is know your target goals understand your risk for or somebody's risk for development of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease i know it sometimes you don't take enough time to use a risk score but maybe that would be a good practice to start so that you know that you have basically uh, evaluated the patient uh, in a more systematic or a clinical manner to decide whether this patient needs to be treated or not and then you can basically inform these patients about their risk so because they would not know what their risk level is so they will be they will happily see the the lab report and think that their their level is within the normal range and they will basically stop i think most of you would have encountered that that patients feel 
take medication for three months or two months, whatever, and then when it becomes normal, they will basically stop, and they would know they wouldn't know what their risk level is. So, be proactive, not reactive. Uh, don't wait for an event to happen and then uh, react to that. Be proactive. Don't be afraid to go up on the doses. Don't be afraid to add medication to achieve your targets. But all, all, always keep the patients informed so that they know what you are doing, and that makes things easier. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Solit. That was a very uh, comprehensive and also a quite up-to-date um, talk you gave. I think um, there are things which uh, we uh, you bridged the gap between in the certain the recent years, and you mentioned about new uh, data, new <coughs> research. So thank you very much for that. We have four questions in our chat box. Yeah. Um, so uh, one question is, the first question is, uh, okay, I will uh, ask this question related to the last slide, someone has asked, how long should we treat the patient and see? I think that's related to- Yeah, that's a very, that's a very, I think, uh, a good question. So when you decide on the risk level, uh, you basically need to achieve, you start your treatment to achieve your target goal. And then what happens is like, like uh, whoever asked, what happens in practice is that, uh, let's say somebody who's had a heart attack, uh, we try to achieve the goal. And then when, the, when you achieve the goal, then you basically reduce your, uh, let's say somebody who's on, who's on 40, you will reduce it to 10. And maybe after three, four months, your, you, your levels would have gone up, but maybe not up to a very high level, but you basically forget that this patient needs to be at this target. So uh, what the recommendations are, when you achieve the target, you basically continue. If the patient can tolerate, you have to take it. Uh, it's probably lifelong medication. Uh, so uh, some people are reluctant to keep the patients on, uh, sometimes on higher doses, but uh, by doing that, you might prevent somebody from actually getting uh, an adverse event, which will basically change somebody's life or the quality of life. Uh, many questions are popping up. I think you'll have to have a long discussion today. So uh, the second follow-up question is, uh, how long after we start statin should we repeat the lipid profile? So normally what they recommend is at least six to eight weeks. So uh, what you do is oh, you start them on a statin, give at least six to eight weeks to see uh, because some people might not uh, even respond or you might not achieve your target goals. Uh, and especially let's say after event or let's say heart attack. The, the biggest risk of getting a second event is during the first few months. So that's why you need to basically try and reduce your levels to as low as possible, as early as possible. So that's why we try to uh, check, give adequate time for the medication to work, but you basically recheck after about six to eight weeks to see whether you have achieved that target. If not, you intensify your medication. So I think that's the same answer probably for the another question. When should we repeat the lipid profile after dose increments? I think that must be the same answer. Yeah, so uh, when you achieve your target, you don't have to do it frequently. You can do it even at six months or one year, depending on the compliance. And if you feel that your patient uh, seems to be stable with your uh, treatment or like maintaining, but always your diet, and your the, the the lifestyle modifications do complement for all of these because even if you uh, take statins and if you're eating all the saturated fats, it's not going to work. Uh, someone has asked, um, in a young patient with no risk factors, 
if LDL is more than 116, 116, 116, does he or she need to get treatment? So, for young patient, no risk factors, LDL more than 116, you so need treatment. So what you need to do is basically, again, your risk level, if you calculate, I, I, I presume you're talking about a person who's at uh, lower risk. So uh, that is less than 1%. Uh, so ideally, you try to do lifestyle modifications and uh, try to achieve the target. But I know most of us, even at some point in my life, even I, I, I was about uh, the, tar the, the low risk group. Because the problem is, it's very difficult, even if you don't have a genetic component, the, the, the Asian diet, it's really difficult to basically cut down on fats, especially if you, let's say you cut down on uh, like coconut oil, whatever, but if you're even drinking milk, you're, you, you're eventually going to have a, a certain degree of uh, a higher LDL than I think probably the Mediterranean or the European people. So uh, the keeping it as low as possible would be the ideal, but it is a practical, sometimes practically it is difficult to do that. So it's, you have to do it on an individual basis. So okay. then uh, uh, another question, the same person has asked, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages in prescribing uh, atrostatin versus uh, rosvastatin? So again, that's, uh, if you take head to head trials, uh, both, I, I showed it in, in one of the slides, comparing both have shown equal efficacy in preventing cardiovascular uh, deaths and events. But the, the reduction of uh, LDL, when you compare, let's say you, you take high intensity rosuvastatin and atorvastatin, the, the level of reduction of the LDL would be a bit more higher with rosuvastatin. But whether that reduction basically clinically uh, or from the trials, that reduction doesn't show any difference in the outcomes. But if you want to reduce, uh, there is a slight advantage of rosuvastatin over atorvastatin when you compare the, the percentage reduction. So, uh, then uh, what are the indications to start treatment for isolated hypertriglyceridemia? So again, what are the indications? So there is new trial evidence just coming up with regards to the effects of hypertriglyceridemia on coronary artery disease. But the evidence is not uh, uh, very substantial because like I said, the, 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 the triglycerides uh, are contained in VLDL and IDL, which also have APOB 100. So that is a form of residual disease. The only indication to start uh, treatment, so if you have a family history of, uh, so again, the, 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 the isolated hypertriglyceridemia, you need to check for secondary causes. Most of the time, it's uh, related to metabolic syndrome and diet and alcohol. So I've come across so many patients, even especially in Europe, in UK, most of their, the, 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 the high triglyceride level is due to their alcohol and then uh, their diet. Uh, if you were, have to treat, that is the, the only indication is to prevent them from getting pancreatitis. So that is the, the, the evidence is uh, treating hypertriglyceridemia is to prevent them from getting uh, pancreatitis. Okay, so this is a kind of a long question. Uh, what Dihan Kaldera has asked, what is the place of vitamin E in the management of high cholesterol in patients with no risk factors, but just a high level of cholesterol detected in routine checkups and the management of these patients in general? Right. Mm -hmm. What is the place of vitamin E? In the management of high cholesterol, I suppose if I could simplify. Uh, to be that. honest, I am not very sure about that. I might need to refer on that because I've not yeah. come across uh, uh, vitamin E as uh, I. The only thing that I give vitamin E is for. Uh, I mean, clin in clinical practice, I've noticed that 
it reduces uh, cramps sometimes, but uh, uh, I'm not very sure, but it might be a very good question. I, I can uh, look uh, into that, but uh, as far as I know, uh, we don't normally use vitamin E as any line of treatment for uh, hypercholesteremia. Okay, maybe uh, Dr. Solit, if you can uh, put your, uh, after this is over, you can uh, put your email address to the chat box. Yeah, then, yeah, sure. then you yep. can ask. Yeah. Then uh, uh, another question is, in patients on statin with myalgia, what is the danger level of CPK where we have to stop statins? And if so, what do you do? One second, I'm just putting my email. So again, uh, statin-induced uh, myositis. So the guidelines basically, uh, they say, if you're with symptoms, uh, if your uh, CPK level is about four times, then you might, again, you have to take into clinical consideration uh, because some people might have very high levels of CPK without any symptoms. So uh, uh, the, the level is at least, three to four times, if it's the upper limit, you can basically think of maybe uh, temporarily stopping the, the, the medication and then you can re-challenge it later. Either you give some time to see whether the, even for liver disease, so uh, for statin-induced elevation in liver enzymes, uh, again, kind of a similar thing, you can basically transiently stop the medication and then Give a time period and maybe think of re-challenging with a lower dose or you can basically change because sometimes some of the settings work in different ways that uh, some of the settings patients might tolerate. So it depends on your enzymatic uh, uh, reactions within the body. So, so how uh, some of the different statins uh, are basically metabolized. So... Uh, what you can do is give a time period and then you can start from at a lower dose and see other contributory factors also. So sometimes if you are doing vigorous exercise on top of taking statins, you might get a very high level of CPK and sometimes even you might not even know that. Okay. So a controversial question uh, someone has asked is which oil would you recommend for LDL reduction? Which? Oil, would you recommend for LDL reduction? Which oil? <laughs> okay, so you mean... <laughs> I suppose like coconut or vegetable or some, maybe something of that. Again, so. that's a, again a very controversial topic uh, when it comes to uh, what oil, uh, because different studies, I think uh, the, the, the problem with coconut oil is that uh, any oil that is saturated in room air is basically taken as bad uh, because uh, you it, it doesn't get broken down in the body. So the, the, the tendency of it to get basically deposited uh, in the peripheral tissues are high. So uh, again, people say olive oil is better. Uh, again, I would say it's a controversial topic where I can't give you a direct answer because the evidence keep changing as well. There's no, if you take any guideline, they, they never talk about uh, uh, giving a specific oil for, uh, for, uh, for, I mean, as the best oil. So uh, I think that should be an individual choice, I think. Maybe here uh, in my role in nutrition, I would say moderation is the best. And and what, and, what uh, oil would you recommend if, in nutrition? Uh, again, um, again moderation. There are uh, again I I don't want to say which and which because there are so many controversies. And like you said, the evidence is uh, I'm I'm not quite an expert enough to say about the evidence. Uh, that I think is another. Uh, subject of its own then uh, someone has asked what are the dietary advices we should give uh, like what food to avoid i'm going to ask you that question so that's your field of expertise I think. We, we can't do this thing this 
<laughs> so uh, again, I would say low on fats, basic dietary advice, right? And low on fats, low on carbs, uh, it, uh, reduce your to, calorie intake. Yeah, it's difficult to, I mean, uh, to be religiously sticking to the diet to actually reduce cholesterol is a bit of a challenging thing because especially in our I think culture and the, the food patterns it's sometimes difficult and people think that you can eat a lot and then still exercise and then bring it down but your exercise plays only a, a minor role it doesn't mean that you shouldn't but uh, when you compare with uh, uh, your food intake or the dietary habits that plays the major role isn't it you, but you have to yes. basically do your exercises as well. It will increase your HDL and then uh, basically uh, burn fat so that uh, the LDL receptors get upregulated. And so then being in being in a regular BMI, exercising and uh, having a non-excessive diet, I suppose, and a, plenty of fruit and vegetables. So uh, sorry about me talking. Then. Uh, Okay, a lot of diet stuff. How many eggs in the diet should we limit per day, sir? I think, I think this is becoming a more like a, a nutritional. Uh, I think you. I think you should have another lecture on this, and then basically. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, then again here, uh, again we we our pet answer here is again there is no consensus as such moderation is the key and if you're uh, some people talk about how many eggs in a sense maybe if they want to uh, get their uh, for protein intake and for weight uh, gym for their you know body uh, weight training body training and things like that so the, in that case if you are taking excessive amounts maybe taking the yellow and eating the white would be if you're taking uh, many eggs for your protein intake that would be a good option but there is no consensus as such about how many eggs to take per day again moderation uh, then how long does uh, triglyceride increase why ldl stay within okay limits how how does sorry how does triglyceride increase while ldl stay within okay limits so that's either you have familial hypertriglyceridemia where your genetic mutation is more uh, in your BLDL or the, the mutation basically affects the BLDL and the, the, the IDL. So your triglycerides are basically transported in uh, those particles. So in that case, your the effect on the LDL would not be high. And the other thing is mainly uh, like I said, most people will have high triglycerides because of diet and your uh, uh, conditions like metabolic syndrome. So in that case, both probably would be high because I showed a typical Sri Lankan scenario where most of us will find our triglycerides are a little bit higher. The Asian population is, the Sri Lankan population does show that kind of a, a pattern where the triglycerides are a bit more higher LDL is not very high, but within some range, your HDL is low. So in that case, you have to think of a secondary cause first and treat the, 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 the causes for uh, secondary causes for triglyceridemia. So because it's basically the diet, isn't it? You take most of your triglycerides from the diet. Then uh, Nilu has asked, is there a relationship between high cholesterol and vitamin D? Mm. Uh, no, I'm not sure about that because that's so, uh, that, Again, uh, that from what I know, it's a bit of a controversial topic. Again, there are research for it and uh, not for it. And it doesn't uh, basically, it, the, the thing is, there can be a lot of theories and correlations, but with how it basically... Uh, affects or affects your treatment options or a management of the patient is what is important. If because things can you can have so many correlations between different things, but clinically if it doesn't have a clinical impact, there is no point of basically going after things because if your LDL, let's say if your LDL is high and your 
vitamin D is whatever, it doesn't basically, because it doesn't change. If your vitamin D is low, you take vitamin D, but that doesn't basically increase your HDL as far as I know. So it doesn't basically, and your higher HDL won't prevent you from getting a heart attack. Okay, then uh, bempidoic acid. I hope I pronounced it right. Is it used yeah. in Sri Lanka? So I think off-label, some of the cardiologists do use it, but I think that is something which might come in to the market at some point because one thing is we have limited options in Sri Lanka to treat patients who are intolerant to statins. So people who really can't take statins but who really need them to reduce another cardiovascular event. So bempidoic acid has shown in the trials that it does reduce cardiovascular risk and there are new trials going on still underway that they've combined uh, statins with bempidoic acid and statins uh, bempidoic acid with acetamide. So those things are still uh, in the pipeline. So we will uh, know in the future whether uh, that uh, a combination of both might give you a better outcome long term. And then is there a place for atrostatin uh, prophylactic, prophylactic atrostatin use? Uh, so primary prevention is prophylactic treatment, isn't it? You try to uh, basically uh, assess the risk. E even then... if the uh, levels are not uh, high, is it all right? Well, I think that's what's so, asked. Again, that's because when you calculate the risk, your risk calculation is something else because you might not have very high levels or you might have like moderate levels of high cholesterol, let's say your LDL is 100, but your when you calculate your risk, it's it should be 55 or 70, then you should be uh, on medication. So it's, it and depends the final on your question. Outcome. Sorry, sorry, please continue. Go on. <laughs> uh, the final question is uh, from me. Uh, is there a place for statins in the management of fatty liver? Uh, again, I not should... directly. No, no. Okay. We don't. We don't normally. Uh, so I think it's part of the metabolic syndrome. So when you basically, uh, what happens is most people who have fatty liver would probably uh, invariably have high cholesterol as well. So you treat it separately, but uh, those are two entities. I think weight reduction and physical exercise will bring down both. So, okay. So I think we asked, uh, we, we have asked you many questions and kept you quite uh, for a long time here. And so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Solitsena Naika. Uh, he is a lecturer at the, Kalam, uh, at the University of Srijayavardhanapura in the Pharmacology Department and a consultant cardiologist. So thank you very much for taking uh, a Saturday off and doing this uh, program for us. The next uh, Saturday talk will be by uh, Dr. Chula Anandala. Uh, he's a consultant a neurosurgeon. So we'll be having it on 6th of July. Uh, the uh, promotional posters will be sent later. So thank you very much. Have a good night, thank everyone. You. And uh, the recording will be available uh, if you email uh, the SLM, it at slma.lk. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.